Acts chapter 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near him. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth, in his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his, dis his, his descendants, but his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared to Azusas, and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Our God is an awesome God. If we've ever read the scriptures, if we've ever thought about them, we should know that statement is true. He is an awesome God. He is a friend worth knowing. Our faith in Him should bring us joy. Our faith in Him should bring us comfort. Our faith brings us together as a church and our faith binds us together. Our faith is the most valuable thing that we could have. And knowing all of that, here is a challenge. Our faith is too good to keep to ourselves. Our faith is too good to keep to ourselves. So our faith is worth sharing. We should be able to share our faith as we share with anybody else. I remember when I was in the 5th, 6th, 7th grade, we lived in Ashland, and my mom had a friend there that they were always sharing, they were always talking, they were always going back and forth. And even when we, they were separated by miles, they would write letters, they'd talk on the phone. If there was a sale, one of them knew, knew about it, the other one knew about it because they shared. They shared where the bargains were at. They shared all kinds of things. Because, see, they thought what they had was worth sharing. Well, what we have in our faith is worth sharing with someone else. Today, we live in a society where everything is shared. Everything's put online. People know about stuff before it happens, I think. It's just out there. In fact, there's a whole lot of stuff shared that we don't really need to know that people are sharing. But are we willing to share our faith as we share everything else? Jesus, Jesus gave us some marching orders in Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you, always to the very end of the age. Some of Jesus' last words give us the great commission to go. Now that's spoken to all people. It just doesn't say for the pastor to go. 
It doesn't say just for the youth worker to go. He is talking <coughs> to all of us. He says, therefore, go and make disciples. And we need to remember that the gospel is for all people. See, sometimes we want to keep it to those that we want in our group. And to those that we think are the ones worthy of hearing. But he says, go and make disciples of all nations, of all people. <coughs> Sharing with them. If they are still breathing, they need to be able to hear the gospel message. <coughs> so if they're still breathing, they need, need to be able to hear the, the good news of the gospel. When I remember, when I moved to Kismet, Plains, in Kismet one Sunday morning, not long after we moved there, <coughs> somebody came, lifted up Terry in prayer. Now Terry had worked for the county, he was about 60, but had really bad diabetes, and he had retired in 60, 61, and they lifted him up that day because he had fallen and he would broken a leg and an arm. And he was pretty much confined to home. And so after worship, I asked where Terry lived. And this one gentleman told me where he lived, and he said, you'll never get Terry to come to church. All right, I still go visit Terry anyway. And I went over to Terry's house, and I visited with him, and I went back several times as he was laid up and visited with Terry and his wife. And, and his wife had had some, and she had taught school for years, and she had some, some kind of brain pain that they, she lost some of her memory, in her short-term memory. But we had some good visits, and, and we didn't talk about anything in particular, but we just visited. And as he got better, and they were able to get out and about, I didn't go over as often, but I'd see them once in a while here and there and talk to them. And one day I saw him, and Harry said, I need to, I need to visit with you. All right, so we, we stopped together one time, and he said, I need to be baptized. And I said, all right, we talked about that, and we set up a time, and his family came, and we had a baptism, and, and Terry was kind of a private person, so we, we'd done this on a Sunday afternoon with his family present, and Mary and I, and we had this baptism, and then I said, but I'm going to announce this in church. And they were in church. And I announced that we had communion, and Terry didn't get around very well. And it took everything he had to get to the front of the church to take communion. But I always remember, as far as those people were concerned, they'd written Terry off. But the gospel is for everybody, and we never give up. Now, if you haven't figured out, we're in the last Sunday of our second part of the Believe series, and our theme is sharing our faith. Now, when you say sharing our faith, that's probably one of the scariest things for most people. But really, it shouldn't be scary. Because first off, the Holy Spirit is with you wherever you go. And it's not about going door to door, knocking on the door and saying, do you believe in Jesus Christ? It's not about standing on the street corner and saying, preaching a sermon. It's about sharing the greatest thing that's ever happened in your life with those in your sphere of influence. Today, our scripture, we find Philip. He finds an easy way to make a disciple this day. He just sits down beside a stranger that he's invited to sit with. He makes a friend. As I look back and think about Terry, I made a friend. Just sitting down and talking with him. But Philip, he sat down, made a friend. Now sitting down and making a friend with someone's easier than for some than others. You see, an extrovert just enjoys talking to people and being around people. And, 
I, I had a friend in Jewel, I've said before, he was an extrovert, he loved the Lord, and he could pick somebody up and take them for 10 miles down the road and drop them off, and before they get there, he's led them to Christ. He can just talk about it, he can just share his faith with them. And then there's the introvert that not so much. It's just hard to talk to others and to share something as intimate as their faith. It, it can just totally drain them and wear them out to even think about doing that. And then there's those like I put myself in, kind of the middle of the road and steady. If you just continue to walk with people and you continue to, to share with them, not in a pushy way, but you just continue to be a presence, willing to spend time, willing to listen to what's going on in their life. And live out our faith with no pressure on them to make a change. And then one day they ask to be baptized. They ask what it means. And to this day, I remember being with Terry in Wichita and St. Francis when he died. And there was nobody that's had more peace. Because he's willing to spend a little time and a little presence. But he'd been written off. So what do we learn from Philip about making disciples? First, we don't know where Philip was headed that day. We don't know where he had in mind that he was going. But an angel appeared and told him to take a certain road. Now, I imagine that Philip knew where he was going. Philip probably knew the shortest route, the shortest best road to take. But an angel appears to him and says, take this road. It, it doesn't give him a reason. It just says, this angel says, take this road over here. That was probably a bad road. Probably the road that you really didn't want to go down. But Philip was willing to listen to the Spirit. And one thing we learned from Philip is you have to be open to listening to the Spirit. You have to be open to accepting a divine appointment. Would God send you an appointment? Do we have that kind of faith? That we let God direct our path? When we really don't know what He's got down that road for us? Maybe that's the road that people have been hijacked on, or, you know, or, or held up on. We don't want to go down that road. Are we willing to accept the divine appointment when God sends us? Do we have faith that when we go down that road, God can work through us, that he will be with us on the desert road? Do we even have faith that God can use us in our interactions with strangers for his good purpose? <clears throat> Last night I was reading in a book that we just had gotten in the story was told about, was talking about divine appointments. And this man was on the airplane. And he said, I, I really try to pay attention to what God's telling me and to do what God's telling me. And he said, I sat down beside this girl in my seat on the airplane and I said, hi. And she was very much, don't talk to me. This is my armrest. Don't look at me. But he said, feeling this nudge in his, in his ribs. It's like God was hitting him. You need to talk to this girl. And he finally looked over at the girl and said, I don't know what's going on in your life, but if you need somebody to talk to, you can talk to me. And she just started pouring out. I'm 17 years old, I'm pregnant, I stole my dad's credit card and run away from home. And he talked to her, and he said, we got where we were going, we landed. She called her dad and her mom, and they said, come home. We'll work this out. Come home. They were just glad to know she was okay. But he said, what would have happened to that girl if I hadn't paid attention to God? He said, it's more important to pay attention to God than to those around you that are trying to deter you from doing what God tells you. And so, Philip, he's, he's going down this road, and he's instructed to stay with this chariot. Now, 
you know, I think about a chariot, and I think, I think about a, a horse pulling that chariot and jogging, and then Philip comes along, and he's just out for a stroll, you know, and God says, stay up with this chariot, get going, and here's the eunuch reading Isaiah. And so he asks the eunuch, do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch replies, how can I understand if no one explains? And he invites Philip to sit beside him. And Philip gets to explain the gospel to this eunuch. And the eunuch says, well, there's water up here. You know, this is a desert. And there's water. And he says, can I, why can I not be baptized? And so he's baptized on the road. What is important about this? Is he invited Philip to come and sit with him? You know, sometimes people, they, they might not say come and sit with me, but they give you the indication that they want to talk. They want some time. But we are so busy in our lives that we block out what somebody else might need. Us sitting beside them. Just being a presence with them. Now, the unity came to know Christ. He did not come to know Christ because he walked into the church one day. He didn't just get up on Sunday morning and say, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to find Christ today. He found Christ because somebody was willing to take time to sit with him and be a presence with him. He wasn't saved because he was up late one night and found a TV preacher on TV and came to know Christ. Or because he found a gospel track. He was saved because Philip took time to sit with him. Philip took seriously the command to go into all the world. And you might even simplify this a little bit. Just as Philip said to him. So often we just run. We're on a dead run in our lives. And we don't take time to sit in. Philip didn't wait for him to come to church. He didn't wait for him to, to hear about it in some other manner. He met the eunuch where he was at. Philip didn't say, well, somebody else is going to do it. And I believe that any church that wants to grow and be stronger needs to understand it's about relationships. It's about your relationship with those in your sphere of influence that you can help change their lives. It's not even about the great preaching that might happen in any church, or it's not about the music, it's not about the kids' programs. We grow because of relationships. People investing in people. You see, the people, most of those people that don't come to our church, they don't know about it. They don't know if there's good preaching or bad preaching or mediocre preaching. They don't know about our kids' programs and, or anything else. They know about it because somebody took time to sit with them and be involved in their life. And they're invited. You see, they need a Philip to sit down with them. Somebody that will sit down and share how God has helped them through their struggles in their life. Somebody that will be there for them. Somebody willing to say, I don't have all the answers, but I sit with my friends at church and we work out and find out the answers. This is kind of where the rubber meets the road in our faith journey. I've heard people say, why do we do funeral dinners for people that aren't members of the church? Because that's what it's about. Loving the people. 
meeting them where they're at, showing them the love of Christ, that they might come to know. That they might know somebody cares, somebody's willing to spend time with them or do, do something for them in their time of grief. You see, at the beginning of the day, Philip didn't have a clue that God was going to use him like he did. Philip just did what the Spirit led him to do. That's why we need to take time to listen. That's why we need to be in tune with God and be in the Scriptures. That's why we need to mark a little time off the calendar for God. But so often we just fill it up and avoid the, ignore the Holy Spirit. I don't allow Him to lead. We don't pay attention to the nudge in our rib cage that says, go and make disciples. <coughs> we need to fulfill the great commandment to go, to love our neighbor as ourselves. It means we love them so much that they don't want to miss out on the greatest story ever told. The story that can change their life. As we walk through life, God wants us to reflect His story. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. Ambassador defined in Webster as a special representative. Isn't that awesome? We get to be a special representative for Jesus Christ. And you're appointed to that position the day you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. And we do that by living our life and loving Christ. You see, what we do matters. What we do matters. And what we don't do makes a difference. So Easter's coming up. It's a great time to invite somebody to a special service. Monday, Thursday, service, Good Friday, Easter sunrise, Easter morning. It's time to move from just hearing to putting it into action. We have some window claims for the doors coming that are going to say, you are now entering the mission field. Just a reminder, a visual reminder as you go out the door that you're in the mission field. And as the old slogan says, just do it. Now, as I thought about this, I was thinking about this week, I was thinking about our wall of truth out there. A wall of truth that either not too many people are buying into or too many people don't want to commit. Because, see, I thought we would fill that up. But we haven't. Where do we stand as a church, as an individual, on our faith? Do we believe in the wall of truth? Do we believe in the things that we've been sharing in the Believe series? Or are they just another sermon? You and God need to work that out and decide where you're at. But He tells us to go. Thank you.